morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. It's really nice to see a full auditorium. My name is Martha Lucy. I'm Deputy Director for Research, Interpretation, and Education here at the Barnes, and it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Yves Alain Bois today. Um, Yves Alain is a Professor Emeritus of Art History at the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He is, uh, and this is not an exaggeration, he is one of the most uh, influential scholars um, of, of our time. His extensive writings on Matisse, Picasso, Piet Mondrian, Ellsworth Kelly have reshaped our understanding of these artists and have had a profound impact on the field of modernist studies. Um, I am not going to stand up here and list all of his accomplishments because it would just, I'd be up here forever. Um, but I will let, tell you that he, um, he's an editor at Art For, or at Art, contributing editor at Art Forum, an editor of the journal October. He has curated or co curated a number of important exhibitions um, on Mondrian, on Matisse, Picasso. Uh, he did a P Picasso Harlequin show, and he has written many, many books. Um, and I am only going to mention one of them today because it is directly related to our talk. Um, Eva Lambois was the lead author on the Barnes Foundation's um, three-volume tome on Matisse, Matisse and the Barnes Foundation, which was published in 2015, and his co-authors were Kate Butler, Claudine Gramont, Barbara Buckley, and Jennifer Mass. Barbara is our um, uh, head of conservation. Um, this was a huge project that began, I want to say, 2004. So it was like 11 years of research into the Matisse holdings leading up to the publication of this book. And this was when I personally met Yves Alain. Um, I think it was 2004. I was fresh out of grad school. He was this like towering, you know, very intimidating figure in the field. And um, I mean, he's still towering and intimidating. But um, I got to know him a little bit, and he's, um, I found I was just very pleasantly surprised by how sort of nice and fun and uh, passionate he is. Um, he was uh, very, very fun to look at paintings with. Um, you know, we, I was not working on the Matisse project, but I was lucky enough to sort of be working at the Barnes at the time, sort of adjacent to that. And so we got to have like the joy of life down in the gallery and look at it together. and. Um, he's somebody who really likes looking at objects, like really looking closely and understanding artistic process, which may seem obvious, like, oh, well, he's an art historian, of course he likes, but trust me, not all art historians are interested in that kind of um, close looking. So um, it is just truly my pleasure to, uh, to welcome you today, Yves Alain, to talk about um, this work, uh, in one of the most important works in our collection, Matisse's Dance, and sort of the story of the, the project, how it came to be. Uh, we'll, we'll see what else he has to say. Thank you. Oh, it's not the first image. It's not. That's the second image, right? Okay. Well, thank you, Martha, for this uh, introduction. and. Uh, as usual, I was very anxious to make sure that I will be up to it, but um, I'm not that towering, I'm kind of real small. <laughs> um, in October 1921, the Barnes Foundation received a visit from a long-time supporter who had some exciting news. Someone had sent him a package in the mail containing important letters and documents that had long been missing from the Barnes archival collections. The mystery package a box had been sent to him anonymously with no return address. When the Barnes staff opened the box, they found inside a large batch of correspondence between Albert Barnes and Henri Matisse, <coughs> most of which was written during the, the thick of the dance mural project. Martha Lucy called me soon after. Maybe she remembered that when Kate Butler, Claudine Gramont, and I were working on the edition of Matisse's correspondence with Barnes for its inclusion in the third volume of our bulky um, Matisse and the Barnes Foundation, 
published in 2015, maybe she remembered that we had been frustrated by the numerous gaps in this documentation. All the more vexing that both Matisse and Barnes seem to have been rather fussy pack rats as far as the paper trail is concerned. Fortunately for us, they were also rather fussy writers, and before being finally calligraphed, in the case of Matisse, or translated and typed, in the case of Barnes, a letter had often to go through the preliminary state of at least one draft, one draft, sometimes many more. So thanks to those drafts kept in either man's position and now hosted in their respective archives, we were able to fill many holes in their exchanges. Many, but not all. For there were several absent letters and telegrams for which no draft was left and of which we had no other trace than some vague allusion in the response they elicited. Furthermore, various diagrams, templates and blueprints were often mentioned as enclosures in the letters we, we did have, as well as in the drafts, and those had been nowhere to be seen. Needless to say, I was very excited when I heard about the unexpected recovery of this treasure trove. Among other things, I was hoping that it contained the enclosures I just mentioned, and particularly that we would be finally able to fully account for the famous error in, mis in measurement that forced Matisse to start anew after more than a year of work on his Grande Décoration, as he called it. On that specific point, I was, rather, I was to be disappointed, but this disappointment was offset by the light cast by the new batch of documents, not only on several obscure aspects of the published correspondence between the artist and his patron, as well as of the dance saga, but also on various aspects of Matisse's aesthetics. So what I propose, only to, what I propose today is to highlight certain features of his correspondence, both in that in that is already, was already published and in the, the letters which are recently discovered with a particular emphasis on what concerns the dance. But before that, so that you can understand better what I think is at stake in the discussion between the two men, I feel that I owe you a crash course on my view of where Matisse was at in this career when he received, out of the blue, Barnes' invitation. At the end of the 20s, Matisse was in deep crisis. Ten years earlier, he had left Paris to settle in Nice, but it is not only Paris that he had left. It is also his previous self, the author of such revolutionary canvases as Bonheur de Vivre, which, which has been on the... No. I just don't remember. I, do I just press on it? The green. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Canvas, uh, you know, was the author of Canvas such as the Bonheur de Vivre, a studio with goldfish, uh, the seated refrain, and uh, let's say the still life with gold of 1916, all works that you can see in the galleries above. He had returned to, uh, when, once in Nice, he had returned to traditional modeling, to local color, and even to some extent to monocular perspective, while depicting almost exclusively reclining women, often nude, in a richly decorated interior. He painted a lot of these canvases. <clears throat> <clears throat> in the early 20s, he was at the peak of his productivity. And then he got bored. By 1929, he could no longer find <coughs> anything new to say in that, in that genre, and in 1930, he called it quits. He embarked for Tahiti for a four-month vacation. Contrary to his expectation, the trip did not produce in him the reboot he craved for. Instead, the spark would be lit during the, sec the next trip to the, US to the USA this time that Matisse took almost immediately after his return to France from Tahiti. It is then, on September 27, 1930, that he visited the Barnes Foundation and that his, its impetuous director commissioned him on the spot to realize a large mural in the Grand Gallery of the building at Merion. The impact of his visit to Merion on Matisse cannot be underestimated. <clears throat> cannot be overestimated. What? I don't know, one of the two. <laughs> but I mean, it was a big impact. <laughs> He was suddenly confronted anew to the production of what specialists call his experimental years, that is, from 1904 to 1917, seeing again for the first time major works that had, been long, left, that had long left his studio, such as, once again, the Bonheur de Vivre. 
One should add that he had recently received, while in Tahiti, the commission of an illustrated book. He had not yet paid much, att much attention to it, perhaps because it was supposed to be an edition of Jean de La Fontaine's fables, that is, of a 17th century text. Now, suddenly, the author of poems to illustrate was shifted to Stéphane Mallarmé, a great love of Matisse's youth, whose conception of poetry has much in common with his conception of art, so much so that many statements written by one could easily have been signed by the other. One must paint not the thing, but the effect it produces. It's a, that's by Mallarmé, but could have exactly have been by Matisse, a perfect example. Incidentally, we do not know when the shift from La Fontaine to Mallarmé was made and even who, whose decision it was. I have the fantasy that it came from Matisse himself while he was contemplating his early works at Marion, a double youth bath, so to speak. Now, what does exactly this youth bath consist of? And why did the commission of the dance, un and dance encourage or rather force Matisse to plunge? This has a lot to do with scale, which had been a core preoccupation of Matisse in his pre-Nice period, that is from 1904, 1904 to 1917. As can be expected, <clears throat> Matisse had been led to focus on the issue via color. I like to quote one of his favorite lines because it is so eloquent in its simplicity. One square centimeter of any blue is not as blue as a square meter of the same blue. Or, to put it otherwise, as Matisse himself did countless, in countless statements, the quality of a color depends, at least for its saturation and value, on the quantity of, of surface it covers. Its hue is affected by this quality as well, though less directly than, the interaction of, uh, than by interaction of neighboring colors. The fact that colors relations are above all surface, qu surface quantity relations had many immediate implications for Matisse's art. The most important one, perhaps, being that the traditional position between color and drawing is abolished. Since any, co any single color can be modulated by a mere change of proportion of surface, any division of a plane surface is, in itself, a coloristic procedure. I quote Matisse, what counts most with color are relationships. Thanks to them and them alone, a drawing can, can be intensely colored without there being any need for actual color. In fact, it is my contention that Matisse made the discovery about color while working on a series of black and white woodcuts at the beginning of 1906 and that he set out to verify in the Bonheur de Vivre. Many fundamental traits of Matisse pre- and post-Nice, that is, before um, uh, 1918 uh, and after the dance. Um, many fundamental traits of, of Matisse's um, pre- and post-Nice art, art unfold from the quality, qu quantity quality equation. First, since a particular accord and the smooth struck by a painting or drawing results in a large part from the difference in quantity between surfaces, it is impossible to work on, the, on, to work on anything without immediately considering the totality of the surface to be covered. This constituted a major point of contention with Paul Signac's incremental divisionist method with which Matisse, Matisse broke dramatically when he painted Le Bonheur de Vivre. Second, once a quantity-quality quality equation is admitted, it is impossible to square up any drawing. If you enlarge a composition, the result will be entirely different from the original. This point is made hammered multiple times in Matisse's writings and interviews, starting with his most famous statement, his notes of a painter from 1908. I quote, an artist who wants to transpose a composition from one canvas to another, to, to a larger one, must conceive it anew in order to preserve its expression. He must alter its character and not just square it up onto a larger canvas. And there, the allusion to squaring up and thus to the use of a cartoon when having to produce a large painting brings me back again for a moment to Bonheur de Ville. For it is <clears throat> while working on this painting that Matisse understood that he didn't need a cartoon. A hypothesis I had made long ago, but there was confirmed by Barbara Buckley and Jennifer Mass in their technical report published in our brick of a book. 
they show that Matisse has begun using a roulette in the upper part of the canvas, which is a sure mark that he was transferring a cartoon, but that he stopped doing it mid-course. Mid in other words, a picture has to be worked as its own definite size, by which, in the words of Barnett Newman, perhaps the only painter who have fully followed Matisse on that score, one will transcend size for the sake of scale. Finally, to go back to the consequence of the quantity-quality equation, since modulation is now a function of surface proportion, traditional modeling is not just redundant, it hampers the outcome. It, I should also add that this equation <coughs> signaled the end of color values as distinct and fixed entities. Now any color can perform any given task on a scale of, of tonalities. Black can even be the color of light, as Matisse stated several times. I don't think it is difficult to understand why being confronted to the enormous surface he was asked to, to, to paint, Matisse thought immediately about size, which is absolute, and even more about scale, which is relative, and how, having suddenly been plunged into this use bath, he was naturally drawn to reconnect with his pre-Nice pictorial syntax. Seeing again Bonheur de Vivre must have played a role in, in his immediate choice of dance as a subject. All the more, since he had already rethought <coughs> this central motif on, on uh, Bonheur de Vivre in uh, the dance <laughs> that uh, that is uh, in a large format, uh, the dance version that is in uh, the Hermitage. Like any other artist, Matisse began by making small sketches. In the first batch of these sketches, he took a trip down to Memory Lane, clearly alluding to the Moscow dan dance and, the, and, and through it to the Bolo de Vivre, and he continued playing with a number of figures for a few weeks. But soon he realized that he, had needed, that he needed to work at true scale. And he rented a garage, more spacious than his current studio, that could accommodate the size of the Marion mural. This actually struck Barnes' pupil, E.T. Dreibelbees, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but when in July or August 1931, he was dispatched to Nice in order to report on the progress of the mural. I quote Driver Bees. Matisse procedure is thorough. He explained that the garage is about the length and width of the large gallery. The point of view is out of the, from the balcony. Repainted walls duplicate the plaster and a new skylight duplication, the illumination. I should note in passing that Matisse would be just as thorough when working on his Vance Chapel in 1949. He moved to a large apartment in the Hotel Regina in Nice because, not a very cheap move, because uh, the size of its walls corresponded to that of the chapel he was designing. But let's go back to the dance. <clears throat> to make his life easier, Matisse tried at first to compromise with an intermediary state, but this did not work. Later in life, he would specifically recall this moment. I quote, when I wanted to make sketches on three canvases one meter long, I couldn't get it. Finally, I took three canvases of five meters each, the actual dimension of the panels. I set out to, oh, sorry, <coughs> um, panel. and one day, armed with a charcoal on the end of a bamboo stick, I set out to draw the, <coughs> the whole thing at one go. It was in me like a rhythm that, ca that carried me along. I had the surface in my head. As for the small color studies he had made, they were particularly useless. I quote, once the drawing was finished, <clears throat> when I came to put in the color, I had to change all the forms I had envisioned. I had to feel the whole thing and make sure that the whole would remain arch architectural. As is well known, working directly in painting at the enormous scale of the Marion mural, that is, testing in paint various compositional schemes, proved impossible. Too taxing phys physically. It is one thing to erase, in part or even in totality, a canvas that is just a few feet high in order to start anew. It is quite, as Baptiste would, would do all his life for smaller canvases, it is quite another thing with a surface that is 11 feet tall and close to 45 feet wide. Thus, the first version of dance, the first painted version of dance at, at scale was abandoned. Or rather, it served as the canvas onto which Matisse would pin his cutouts of colored papers, the device he adopted in order to be, <coughs> in order to be able to continually change his design 
<coughs> which happen daily at times, without having to erase or paint anything until all will be definitely set. This first version, now called the Unfinished Downs Mural, was discovered in a warehouse some 25 years ago, rolled up like an old rug and with thousands of pinholes. As I said, it served as a material support on which Matisse would, would work out the second version, which, as you'll quickly understand, will turn out once finished to be the third. But a note in passing about this first version. After <clears throat> the preliminary small sketches mentioned earlier, those in which Matisse played, played with a number of figures, we have almost no extent iconography concerning its progress in sc at scale. All we have left, firstly, is two sets of photographs, faintly showing the whole composition sketched on, with charcoal on three large canvases, which Matisse sent to Barnes in April 1931. They were actually the first and only things Barnes had ever saw at the time. And secondly, a gorgeous brush and ink drawing at the definite scale of the legs and torso of a standing figure in a central bay. This striking drawing now on view in the wonderful Matisse exhibition currently at the museum, the PMA, is alone in its kind, which makes one regret, perhaps, that Matisse switched to photographic record and paper cutouts, paper cutouts as working progress, process. One dreams of all the marvels he would have left us with as if he had st stuck to brush and ink drawing, drawings made to scale on paper. The rest of this story is relatively well known, though there could be a missing stage in the documentation. One would assume that Matisse began his work on the second round by making sketches on charcoal directly on the canvas, on the new canvas, before starting to play around with his paper cutouts, since it is indeed how he would <coughs> uh, later attack the round three. But this sketching stage never existed for this second version. He did not bother <coughs> to have, and he didn't bother to have photograph taken, or, or I mean, he might have existed, but there's no photograph. And given that he took great pains of having every slight modification of, <coughs> um, in the shape and placement of his paper cutouts, dutifully recorded, I tend to think that at, at this, this at this point that he skipped the charcoal on canvas stage altogether for the second version. From the late fall of 1931 to the end of 1932, we have no less than 15 consecutive photographic records of the paper, paper, paper cutout evolution of the second version of the dance. More than half of them posterior to the catastrophe, which tells us a lot of the way Matisse thought about this art and his responsibility of an artist. What catastrophe? On February, uh, 19, uh, February 2, 1932, just as Matisse thought his work on the dance was almost co completed, and those, those, this, this is about the, 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 at the end, around the time, he discovered that he had made an incredible error regarding the measurement of the pendentives on which he had relied all along. He had thought they were 50 centimeters wide. In fact, they were twice that. His nearly finished second version was unusable as such. It would have had to be cropped, which for Matisse, of course, was utterly unthinkable. This was a huge blow. And I'll explain later how the mistake came about since a few tidbits contained in the new documents clarify somewhat the issue. He quickly realized that he needed to start anew, to create a third version, thus, on a canvas with the proper dimensions. His whole composition had to be rethought in order to cope with a, this bulkier architectural reality, except for the pink, blue, black, gray palette, which he did not want to modify. That seems strange at first, but it is consistent with the quantity-quality equation idea. As he wrote about it, the colors which are the same are nonetheless changed. The quantities being different, their quality also change. The colors are applied in a completely straightforward way so that it is a quantitative relations that produce their quality. Matisse is very, you know, when he has an idea, he sticks to it. <coughs> 
<laughs> and I'm like that too. Uh, what is particularly interesting, though, is Matisse's fir first reaction. He immediately lets Barnes know that he will first finish his second version before attacking a third one. That is, he would bracket for as long as it takes the whole issue of having to invent a new composition and fulfill his obligation to Barnes so as not to lose momentum on a nearly completed version, which was still, remember, only at the paper cutout stage. Needless to say, this was a huge gamble, given Barnes' increasing impatience, but, Matisse relief, relief, but to Matisse's relief, his patron took the news rather well and to the surprise of anyone who has studied this affair. For three more months, Matisse continued to work on the second version. Then he put it aside, it was still on the paper cutout stage. He put it aside because he felt it was finished. And um, he put it aside to attend the Malarme illustration while staying in Paris. We do not know exactly when he, the chapter three of the Danse Saga began. It is interesting to note that in the very few a uh, few sketch uh, of paper, uh, on paper devoted to it, he seems to be revisiting the drawings he had made for the first abandoned version. But he clearly concluded that this would not go. It is only in August 1932, no, quite a lot after the discovery of the, uh, the error, <clears throat> that back in Nice, Matisse set out to work with a passion on the third dance composition, sketching directly on canvas with a piece of charcoal at the end of his bamboo stick. He worked at it non-stop until the end of, no uh, of November with a charcoal play uh, thing. We have um, 10 different photographic records of the charcoal on canvas stage, after which he shifted to paper paper cut te technique, and we have 22 <laughs> uh, records between November and March. The paint application made by an assistant was started on March 21, 1933, and <clears throat> the whole thing was finished by mid-April. Matisse arrived in Merion uh, with his decoration a month later to supervise its installation in situ, and relieved, he was relieved and fully satisfied by his accomplishment. But though uh, he came back exhausted from his trip uh, to, uh, to America, it did not take long for him, back in his studio in Nice, to think about the unfinished business of the, this then still second version. He took it up again, no doubt submitting his design to the same quasi-daily attention as he had done for the Marion version. He completed in November 33, making it fully the third and final version, which the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris acquired in 1937. It is now called the Paris Dance Bureau. To quickly sum up the numbering of the dance version, in case you are getting lost like everyone else, <coughs> for a very long time, the Paris version, <coughs> which I've called here the... Sorry. The Paris version, which I've called here the second, was deemed the first. And the Barnes version, which I call here the third, was deemed the second. But we now know that the unfinished version is the first, the Barnes version the second, and the Paris the third. So it's like that. <laughs> One, two, three. <clears throat> Enough contextualization. Now that you have the frame, let us look at what the correspondence between Matisse and Barnes reveal and at what it adds to the narrative. The first striking thing is Matisse's immediate grasp of the difference between an easel painting, even a large one, and what it has to produce, which he calls peinture architecturale, the concept that he forged when speaking of his grande décoration. This was already clear in the draft he had published in, of the first letters he, he sent to uh, the draft we had published of, uh, uh, um, of the first letter he sent to Barnes upon his return to Nice after his first visit to Marion, but he's even more eloquent in the version he sent to his patron. After having noted the difficulty of his task, given the odd of oddity of the space he would have to deal with, he thanks Bass Barnes to have thought of him to terminate the architecture of his room. Terminate, so it's an architectural procedure, uh, not a painting one. 
Unfortunately, I, can, I cannot elaborate further on this crucial and very, very complex issue of peinture architecturale, but um, if interested, I encourage you to read Kate, Linger's, uh, Kate Butler's um, entry on the dance and as well as my long essay in our big book, big collective book. Another striking figure is now, is how much Matisse is worried about getting <clears throat> the getting the exact dimensions of that he has to cover right. He worries about how the templates would be made, he even imagines problems that when they are known. At one point he thought that the cornice above the doors would be in the way. He's repeatedly asked to, for a copy of the architect's blueprint for a return of the templates that he had they had, had been taken from the wall itself and which he had sent back to bounce so the wood stretchers would be fabricated. That, the endless worry of Matisse on a, one every two, two letters. And when he discover, discovers the mistakes, <clears throat> by noticing the difference between the architect's blueprint and the templates, as he, he was thinking of the possible installation of his decoration together with an architectural model in his retrospective at the Galerie Georges Petit, which was scheduled in, to open in June 1931, he's devastated. The long letter he writes to Barnes helps actually understand how the mistake was made. He had overseen two bands of paper, overlooked, sorry, two bands of paper which were added and folded under the templates alongside the penances. If only your pupil who came in July had alerted you that the measurements had been taken by him and myself with utmost care, you would have told me of the mistake. At that time, the consequence would not have been so severe and I could still have modified my composition, but now I must start entirely anew. When I first read this, I could not comprehend what Matisse was talking about, because the drawing that Dry Delby sent to Barnes seemed to be absolutely correct. That is, the width of the penances are, are drawn correctly. But once I looked closer, I realized that the measurements themselves are wrong. One inch and seven inch plus 19 for one side, and uh, one and and, and 19 inch and, and 58 plus 178. You can see in the drawings, very, very bizarrely indicated under the penalties. It's very, very weird the way, to, the way it's put. It would have been much simpler if you had simply made it, you know, a line with two arrows and, you know. <clears throat> so, you know, this is very unconventional way of making, the, of noting the measurement just at this point of the penalties, where everything else is perfectly fine. Um, that played a big role in the goof up. And, you know, I don't see why Barnes would have bothered looking at you know, with a magnifier to these little numbers and realize that they were long, since the drawing looked perfectly fine. <coughs> Same for Matisse, uh, in a way. Another amazing, amazing passage, uh, this one in the draft we had already published, is Matisse's reflection about the sheer, the sheer athletic effort in working at such a scale. I now believe that I can do that I have found a way to install these immense canvases in my studio and to extend my legs and arms for the dimensions of the canvases that are superhuman. I took command of their large surface. I have drawn the figure several times and I'm happy to say that I have grasped the whole, the whole just as well as if they were ten times smaller. Only my physical body has not grown. And then he goes to complain how tiring it is and all that. This passage was dropped in the final version that Matisse sent to Barnes on, on April 24, 1931, but he kept the part in which he explains why he refused to say anything about the work in progress. I have noticed that anything one might say about the painting being executed is as much energy one diverts from it. From it. <clears throat> and he <clears throat> offers a, uh, a compensation. <clears throat> the first two sets of photographs that he sends to Barnes. <clears throat> <clears throat> the caption in, uh, that he makes in his letter is puzzling. Series one, the first contact with the surface. Series two, second approach, more architectural, I believe. It has long been noticed by Jack Flam and many others in his wake that Matisse wanted at all costs to avoid a visit of Barnes to his studio in Nice. The painter was particularly worried that his patron would be irked by the fact that, and this up until a month before he arrived in Marion with the decoration and the wraps, 
that he would, he would uh, when, when that he was afraid that Barnes would discover that he had, there was no painting properly speaking to, uh, to you know, that means that no properly no painting properly speaking to show at that time. It was still in, uh, in paper cutouts. A large amount of Matisse's letters to Barnes during this entire course, the entire course of the work on the dance is devoted to various maneuvers to present Barnes from coming and having a peep. It is only in January 1933 that the collector will be allowed in Matisse's studio. And for the great relief of Matisse, did, Ma Barnes didn't, you know, um, did not belt in, in, belt in, in seeing the paper cutouts and he approved of the work in progress. At one particular moment, tricky moment, when Matisse comments upon his discovery of the mistake in the letters quoted above earlier, uh, he begs Barnes not to come and bring, and, to bring, and, and bring the templates. Just send them, just send them. To help that peel go down, because there were so many letters that Barnes was beginning to think it's very weird that I were constantly, you know, to help the peel go down, <laughs> Matisse enclosed a gouache done just a few days earlier based on the state of the composition at this point. That is, that's the second version, you know, it's, uh, it's, which has not yet been abandoned, it would be abandoned just like one minute later. <clears throat> In short, Matisse used any means at his disposal to avoid an impromptu visit. There are many other gems in this correspondence, sometimes not directly related to the dance, but to the monograph Barnes was at the time writing on Matisse's art. For example, in a letter sent by the painter on July 32, one finds reminiscence about the copies he had made in his use of 18th century French paintings in the Louvre, Vato, Fragonard, Boucher, but also with his comment on how to deal with, how to deal with the unseasonally cold weather uh, in Paris at the time, because he had moved from Nice for his, for his exhibition. For me, this is totally bearable, because I'm in the light of Mallarmé's poetry, which is really much clearer than one usually believes before spending the time it takes to dig into its musical bark. Speaking of Mallarmé, a month later, Matisse sends to Barnes a photograph of two plates for it, from his illustrated book, urging him to substitute them for the version he already owned and intended to reproduce in his book. I remade them because I found them not large enough compositionally. Once again, addressing the issue of scale, by the way. Surprisingly, Barnes yield for one of those, and, but in the other, it seemed it was Matisse who changed his mind um, because the plate reproduced by but Bart in his book is the same that is owned by the foundation. So here you have the, the um, one of the, 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 the simpler one is the one Matisse wanted um, Barnes to reproduce and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and Barnes said yes, I agree for this, in that particular case. There are two uh, last tasty morsels in this correspondence that I would like to mention. The first one is more, one more proof of Matisse's fastidious attention to the utmost detail. On November, thank you. Yeah. On November 11, 1932, just when his work on the Marion Dance is very well advanced, <coughs> he asked, with the help of an explanatory diagram, <coughs> sorry, he, sorry. He, he, he writes a very, he's very, in very anxious letter, and he sends along mark, marked, marked up tracing papers, and um, he asks with an explanatory diagram that someone indicates which portion of the composition in a lateral base will be hidden from view by the arches from a, for a beholder standing on any of the three balconies on the opposite side of the main gallery, the green Arrow, uh, my transposition of Matisse's recommendation of what, what photographs to take. <coughs> You're right, maybe I should just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the letter was sent in, in, um, in, uh, in November. Barnes keeping mum for several weeks, <clears throat> Matisse sent another letter on December 6, asking the same question in a simplified version this time. He, his main concern about the available view of a beholder standing in a central balcony, a, a view on the lateral lays from someone standing in front of a central. 
So this is going to fall, maybe not, maybe not. Two days later, he thanks Barnes for his response and for the tracing papers duly annotated. Now, what is interesting is that Matisse was perfectly right to ask this question, as can be seen in the photograph taken by Martha Lucy yesterday on her smartphone at my request. Yes, yeah, something is hidden, but you know, in this, in those, with the angle. <clears throat> You know, a, a, a significant portion of each of the lateral bays are indeed visible for a beholder standing in the balustrade, you know, from whatever um, place in the balustrade. But the strange thing is that Matisse decided in the end not to do anything about this. That is, there is no possible, possible change on the paper cut version of the design after he received information that he had so anxiously waited for. This said, he was probably still a bit anxious about it, as one of the very few photos that were taken of him contemplating his grand oeuvre installed in situ show him looking at it from the balcony together with Albert Nutty, Barnes conservator. The last little marvel I want to mention is an extraordinary detailed and long letter that Matisse sends to Barnes on August 8, 1932, the longest by far, actually, that he wrote him. It is a typical case of what we call in French l'esprit de l'escalier. Matisse blames himself for not having corrected Barnes during a meeting they had in Paris when he said to him that, when Barnes said to him that he was, conceive, that he was conceiving his works through color. And that drawing for him was secondary. Because Barnes is in the process of finishing his monograph about him, Matisse feels the urge to rectify this view which is at first very surprising given Matisse's reputation as a colorist. But it is surprising only if one forgets about the quantity-quality equation mentioned at the outset. He always starts with a drawing, he writes. I worked on the decoration for six months by drawing only. I can work for months just with drawing. If you look at my drawing in the shade, you'll see that each part of the paper is delimited, it, it delimits as its particular quality, which is to say its particular color. The letter contains many other riches, notably a credo concerning how and why a motif strikes Matisse emotion emotionally enough for him to want to paint it, and how terrified he is each time he begins working on a canvas, a fear that he needs to overcome first in drawing before beginning to tackle the venue of color. Another passage of this dance letter gets back to the issue of the architectural drawing and decoration versus easel painting. Matisse is afraid that in the monograph on his art, Bart will not differentiate between the two. In, in his pictorial pra practice, that he will judge the two according to the same criteria, and particularly that presenting the Marion, Mur Marion Muriel as the apex of his art, he will consider him as a mere decorator, a worry that is perhaps not entirely unfounded when you read um, uh, Bound's book. I've always a bit trouble when my color lead people to say that I only conceive my work through color. For color is not sufficient for me. I'm not only a decorator, but also a painter of emotions. I am more profound than a decorator. Like Veronese or Tintoretto, all things being equal, of course, humbly. Upon receiving this letter, Barnes replied, it would not be too lengthy to, it would be too lengthy to write you in detail what I meant by my remarks on color, but I can assure the, you that you will agree with my idea when you read them upon the completion of the book. We shall never know if this had been the case. I have my doubts. <laughs> Shortly after receiving the book, Matisse wrote in late February, early March 1933, that is, just as he was finishing his work on the Million Dance, it was just the moment where he just simply go from, take out the paper cut out and painting. Matisse writes, I look, often look at your book and find the reproductions to be very good, but I have to be, I have not been able to find someone to translate it to me. I have not lost hope. I'm very proud of this book. The Envision translation never happened for our great shame as it would have been precious to read the, doc the comments Matisse would have sent to Barnes or if not the many marginalia Matisse, with which Matisse would have almost certainly adorned his copy. Of course there are many more things about uh, which one could talk in this correspondence between the two men, but I, I like to say, I think it's appropriate to end with a question mark. What would Matisse have thought of Barnes book? <laughs> uh, <voilà>. That's it. <laughs> Do 
Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> if you'd like, you can use the podium mic, if you would prefer. Mm -hmm. So we'll take questions from, um, from online, but also um, in the room, of course. So um, please, who wants to? OK. OK, I'm going to throw this. Whoa. <laughs> cool. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Veronese in, in your remarks. I was thinking, did the quality-quantity uh, relationship come up in classical um, architectural pieces like the Sistine Chapel? I never read anything in color theory or in, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a specialist for... Uh, for any, I'm, yeah, I'm especially for only a very tiny portion of history of art in a very tiny part of the world. So, um, but uh, I have never read anything in the series of color of the past that refers to this issue of the quantity uh, is it being the what what's uh, cre determined the quality of color. I, I never never did except in Matisse who repeats that all the time. I mean, uh, every single interview almost it's just like it's an obsession of his. But I don't. I, I don't uh, maybe, maybe there are some Al some remarks in Albers and uh, Joseph Albers where he speaks a little bit about that, but I never heard any treaties of color from the classical age that we as never. I mean, uh, <laughs> sorry, I just I, I don't have it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, if anyone, so sorry. If anyone else has any questions, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, also, uh, we're checking if there are any online questions, but again, I can run this box to you. <laughs> Could you pass this on? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, sorry about that. Uh, was the mystery of who sent the letters and where, where they were found no, I mean, ever I, solved? I, it could have been prosaic or it could have been really cool. It's, 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 it's someone who had, at some point, um, had access to the archive because, you know, I mean, in a, in a big book that, uh, that uh, has been mentioned many times, which is a big, bulky, three-volume thing, uh, you know, very often in, we, we publish anything we had, including the drafts, and sometimes we only had the draft of one part of a letter or something like that, but we knew that those letters existed because we had the response or we had, you know, um, and, so we have no idea, but it's someone who must, at some point, have an access to the archive here. That's all we can say, right? I mean, yeah, I was in the booth. Was it about the return of the letters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we did not know. I was like trying to, I was trying to read the footnotes of. And I, I and I spent some time looking at all the foot carefully at all the photos of all the scholars who had written and everything. Oh, maybe some scholar was a little <laughs> had a little sticky fingers, but no. <laughs> we don't know when they went missing, but I think we, uh, we first noticed that they that there was a gap um, in say 2000, even before you started on this project. Yeah. first noticed, but as for when it was actually taken? Well, no one, one, one no thing which had, we had hoped to recover was the famous templates, because they, they kept being, and, and the architect's blueprint, although that probably would not have helped that much, but it would have helped understanding the, the mistake. But the, the templates were things that were taken with Bar, when Matisse was here for the first, at his first visit, that's when it was, no, the second visit, sorry. Um, he came back and they take templates, and he's very worried. He sends many letters about how to take plans, which is very easy. Uh, you know, it's, it's, but it's, it's a, little a little more complicated than normal because it's harsh. And so, but you know, you just put paper and you, you cut it up and, and you know. Um, so, and these templates were sent back and forth several times. Uh, les gabarits, of course. And, uh, you know, we, we had hoped that they would be, they, because they don't have them in, in the Matisse, um, Okay, I've been Paris, so they must, you know, they must be here. Georges Matisse, who um, uh -huh. runs the Matisse archives in Paris, 
was visiting a few weeks ago and I told him the story of the returned letters and he said a similar thing happened to us. Um, I, and I don't remember when it was, but mm -hmm. he said that they received a package in the mail. <laughs> and it was, yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know. <laughs> what? It, it's the postmark. There was no postmark. There was no, it was completely impossible to, to trace. There was no return address. I didn't address. know yeah. the story about the vet. Yeah. They never told me. Well, yeah. yeah. That's funny. Maybe it's the same person. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess we could. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? Okay. Yes. So, you know, very specific color choices in this piece, which are limited color choices. Um, any information about contemplating what color to use and how, how much deliberation and uh, did he, was done about what colors specifically he would choose he's, for he's, the piece. The, he, he didn't speak much about it. He, he tried several several things which he didn't like, uh, and he said something about wanting to have something that is very cold and detached. And uh, and at some point you say architectural, but that's easily easily you know. But he said he, he didn't want something to be um, yeah. He says. I don't have the, the, the word exactly, but uh, in, uh, in the quote, but he said it has to be did. Because one of the things that he wants, he, he doesn't want the, he had this idea for the architectural, the, the, the genre of what he calls architectural painting, he had this idea that it should be kind of, uh, you should not force your attention. You should not be, in front of easel painting, he says, it makes a big difference. You have to go through it. You have to enter the, you know, the whole world. He doesn't want an architectural painting to do that. He wants it to be, uh, you know, almost like, like Muzak. You know. <laughs> um, and he, he's, he's very, he's very determined, and he writes many times about it. But he doesn't want his painting to be judged like that. So it's diff two different categories in his mind. So, so he doesn't want a color which is super saturated. He doesn't want color that uh, he wants to, that in the color you have kind of like memory that it is masonry that is you know that it is a wall things like that. It's very um, it's not very specific uh, at the what color you would choose, but what's specific is so not something that cries for for attention. Yeah. And and contrasts that are not as violent as many of the other that, that you could have expected. You know. Uh, thanks for the lecture today. Beautiful, wonderful topic. Um, I wonder if you have comments to, that could be geared toward artists who may be watching as an archivist of, te of telling them, hey, take some care to document what you're doing. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, this came up several times through your lecture, you know, um, and it, I actually have a very early piece from an artist who's alive and saw him and showed him this picture, and he had no idea. He said, wow. You lost these things, and you said some of the pieces that had left his studio, and and this idea of you know in an age where we're recording everything digitally, uh, do you have comments for artists and, and people who are working through their own process um, that we can <laughs> teach them and so on that these kind of things? Uh, I, I mean, just yeah, keep keep things. If you keep too many things, there might be a problem too. But you know, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, when you have too too many documents, sometimes you just uh, you, it's hard to make the, you know, to de determine what's what's important and what's you know. There are things which are more important than others. But yeah, but you know, um, we are. I mean, I'm an historian, so you know, we 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 can't work without without um, documentation. So I, I have the feeling that artists today are well, especially if they have a gallery, are much more careful in keeping things. Um, also, artists who who, who are have the reputation of being totally messy and, uh, and uh, ended up very often to be the best archivist. Picasso was an extraordinary archivist. He kept up everything. Uh, everything. Um, no, Kelly also the same. But Picasso, you would, it was kind of surpri surprising. This bohemian, whatever. It's just, he, he never saw a single, you know, single piece of paper. So. Um, I will uh, read a couple of questions from online. Uh, first, just a comment. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I love your discussion of poetry, color, and size slash scale. 
Um, and then there are a couple questions about drawing, um, sort of if you could talk more about the relationship to the drawings and the, and the, and the painting, and also what do you mean when you speak of a, of a cartoon? Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, it's an artistry term. I should have explained. A cartoon is a is a big uh, drawing. Uh, I mean, not a, not very big at first. It's a, it's a, you have a drawing and then you you enlarge it by squaring. You, make little, you divide the grid and and you you enlarge, you enlarge to another grow, drawing with the apple this grid and then you enlarge a second uh, enlargement to a bigger one, still using the system of a grid. You know, you just multiply by uh, you copy by squaring up and making a grid and then copying every little portion of that's the square uh, in the larger grid and, and so forth and so forth. That's, the cartoon is a final uh, piece of paper which is to scale. I mean, it's no paper, it's ma sometimes many, many different papers because those things, we be, it was mainly for frescoes. It was a, uh, artists could needed a cartoon for different reason than, than just scale. There's also the way a fresco is made, all that. But basically, to have something that's to scale, and that, uh, but that's also for the, the, the word is very familiar with tapestry. You know, that, that's uh, what was used also for, you said, the cartoon of tapestry. And that's what it is. It's a big drawing on paper that was used for the. For the. So, using a cartoon means that you, you have at some point, you needed at some point to find a way to enlarge something uh, in a kind of mechani almost mechanical manner. And, uh, and artists had done that all the time when they used to cover a large surface. And Matisse thought about it for, he had, he had, used, he had used cartoon before, and he thought about it for using it for the bonheur de vivre, and he realized, I don't need it. It's, 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 it's not the way I work. It's, since I have to start to think at, at full scale, yet it has, my, in, it has to be in my, in my mind, I, it doesn't make any sense to me to start with a little, little sketch and, and enlarge it. So here's another question from online. Um, what is the story be behind the discovery of the of the canvas with the pin? I think the, the rolled up one yeah. that you mentioned. Where and when and by <laughs> whom? Uh, first I, think version, I yeah. don't quite know exactly. I don't quite remember where, but it was it was um, and who discovered it? It was, it was um, uh, the um, oh, sorry, I have like a name. Uh, Jacqueline Monnier. She she was the. The daughter of uh, Pierre Matisse, so the, grand, the granddaughter of Matisse, daughter of Pierre Matisse, and uh, she, it was, I think it was a warehouse of the, some family possessions or something like that, or I mean, I can't remember, it was, it was something, you know, it has it had been there since, since Matisse di di died or something like that, so it, it was suddenly, this, yeah, a total surprise. Uh, thank you, Ivala. Uh, wonderful, fantastic lecture. It won't surprise you at all that I'm going to ask you about the other grand decoration uh, by Monet that are sort of hovering all over this, and not uh, not stylistically, because mm -hmm. obviously the differences are perfectly clear. But in terms of the making of architectural painting and what Matisse in 1930, what one in 1930 would have known about the complicated history of the, of the orangerie, of the endless back and forth, of Monet's connection to Clemenceau, whether those letters had been published. I think Clemenceau's Monet book was out by 1930, I believe. And so, uh, because there, there seems to be a cautionary tale here that Matisse and Barnes are partly responding to her because Monet had kind of waited too long with that, was dead by the time that all those paintings were transferred to the public, so he was not in charge of its actual installation. So I'm, I'm just wondering um, how, how, that, how that episode loomed over all of this. It's a very good question of which I uh, do answer, and I'm sure there is, but I never thought really of it. Um, I mean, you know, Matisse admired Monet, of course, and you know, and he, I, he must have read the book of Clemenceau. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, <clears throat> but uh, I don't remember any remarks by Matisse on, on Monet, in particular on Orangerie, except that when when Matisse always wanted to have to be able to have more, de, de, you know, um, decoration or peinture architecturale as, as a kind of relief from the doing easel painting from time to time. He, he wanted to, and he was very frustrated when the, the state of Paris and the, and the city of Paris, the state of France and the city of Paris did not 
commission anything by him for the, 19, for the 1937 International Fair. And that's when he, that's when he gave it to, the, to Paris as a kind of, uh, as a kind of uh, you know, something like that to, to, the, to the French government. Uh, but at that time, he, he was specifically then, I think that I, I would have to find in my notes, but there is, there is at the time kind of reminder of the problem with the, with the Orangerie thing. Because when was the Orangerie open? Do you remember? Yeah, so I think, um, but that's, you know, speaking about one decade later, but uh, I, it's a very good question and I, you know, uh, I don't have any answer, but it, it, makes, it makes perfect sense to me that he would, he would have had this, you know, example and, uh, and the difficulty of, uh, that Clem also had to make the thing accepted, I'm sure, I'm sure he thought about it. And, uh, I'm sorry not to have an answer because it's a good question. <laughs> but, uh, ah, many hands there. <laughs> yeah, when I, when I saw the uh, exhibit at the Philadelphia Museum, I came away thinking, ah, perhaps the experience with the Barnes was influential for him developing his cutouts later on. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's, that's the way it started. You yeah. see, at first it was only as like an experience, not to have to, you know. Yeah. Matisse, in, in, when he made a painting, he very, very often, uh, he needed to start anew. So he would, he would erase everything and start again. But, you know, uh, doing that on something which is that big, it's impossible. And um, you can do it a little bit with, when it's only at the char charcoal stage. You just, you know, but you know, just having it's too complicated. That's when he so he used the paper cutouts as a as an expedient to to go faster. But then he, he got interested in that and he made a few things, not much, a few things in the which one of them is in the show, maybe two is in the show, in the, in the, uh, for you know cover of a book and a few a few very beautiful early paper cutouts. But he, he kept that a, a kind of a, a Bay for another, you know, until jazz really. So for another 12 years, 13 years. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it was determined, you know, it was uh, that and something else, which is, um, uh, which I, I, I did not mention. And in fact, it's, it's alluded to in the letters in a very interesting way. The idea of photographic record of a work in progress. It, it, Matisse is the first one to have published these kind of things, and and uh, there is a thing very amusing in the, in the, and you know, and he, he speaks about the pedagogical role of publishing these state photographs, and Barnes is going to do, and and you know, it, Matisse published published as the work is being done in in uh, in journals in France and whatever. And he, he seems like he gets this idea that it is very interesting, and he himself published quite a lot of those things in various journals and and, and all that. And um, in the le letter to Barnes, he said, oh, I just heard that Picasso just said he's making that with a print. And, and so he, and said he, he will, you know, he makes, a, he makes a, a print of each state of a print. And so at the end, he has, he has a kind of evolution of the work. And, and he says, I hope that he did not hear that I was working like that. So I hope it is, we, re we re are reunite, reunited by some wonderful coincidence. Because, you know, at that time, the war with Picasso was gone. So, um, but... Uh, it was very interesting. I hope, j'espère que c'est une bonne coïncidence. Something like that. Oh. Uh, Ivana, <coughs> thank you for your talk. I, I wonder, do you have any thoughts on the way the unfinished and the Paris dance mural are displayed at the museum in Paris yeah. these days? And also, why did it take so long for them to be put on display? Well, like, you know, French. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, uh, that, I don't know. So what was the first part of the question? Yeah. Any thoughts on the way that they're, they're displayed today? Uh, well, it's, it's, I think it's, it's very difficult to find a solution to do that. Uh, it was even more, you know, how do you do? I mean, how do you, it's, it's I don't know. I, <laughs> <laughs> that means a lot in French. I, I, think, I think that if you had a room where they could be one next to each other, that would be a lot better, but I don't think there is that room there. Uh, it's it's huge, so I don't know. It's very strange, you know. It's like a, it's like a, like a I don't know. How do you call it? It's like a wave of, it's like a, a sea that comes to you and then goes back. It's very strange. It's uh, they are parallel, exhibited parallel. It's just very strange. Anyway. Uh, 
Yeah. It's not really a question. First, to thank you for this fantastic and eye-opening presentation. Um, and now, to just come back to the issue of Monet, uh, Matisse, and the Grande Decoration, um, I was thinking uh, whether this kind of polyptic idea, um, which is almost like a Japanese screen type of thing, and the way the imagery moves from the one panel to the next, mm. and the colors and the forms, they have to have a kind of flow. Whether that part of Monet's Grand Decoration affected, if Matisse was aware of it, affected his way of images and figures flowing from one of the arches to the next, because there is definitely uh, uh, an arabesque that runs, runs to them. I'm using the term in its Delacroix uh, uh, use, actually, of yeah. the arabesque. Yeah. A kind of continuous, although but there is, although uh, there is, um, irregular shape. In terms of the movement of the figures, it's far less in the in the in the bound in the in the you know bound version. It's much more contained, especially in the central area. Uh, they are like, it's like they are, they are couples, you know, I mean, it's... Uh, but e what e about the limbs that show up? Yeah, sure. Abstract, the limbs no. that they continue somewhere sure. else, that we can't see. Sure, no, no, sure. Yeah, but, but, it's, but it's far, you know, I would say that like, Monet has, uh, wants to produce this kind of oceanic feeling of the kind of atmosphere, general atmosphere in, you, in which you, you, you know, you are uh, like d daydreaming or something like that. I, I don't think that Matisse was trying to, to do something so, Similar on that oh, one. No, like yeah, yeah. But you know, but the idea, he thought a lot, but you can see that, it, well, the first version, of, the first idea is drawing based on the, on the dance of Leningrad. So they were, the, the dancers are turning around, uh, and uh, the, 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 well, the first, the, 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 the sketch for the, f the first sketch for the first version. And then you can see he, he has eliminated that by putting this standing figure in the center. So he's already limiting the idea of a complete Arab, complete uh, you know dance that everyone uh, is doing the same movement. Quite few. Then it, it becomes it becomes much more disjointed because they seem to go in various directions without continuation. There, in the bounce, he recent in the bounce version, he has, has recentered things. Uh, I think. I mean, he still wants to have this, you know, this escape. Uh, the, the, the figures are going out of the, you know, the famous cropping. You know, that's more like a, it's more Degas than Monet, by the way. But uh, that for that for that thing. But but I think it's what's very really interesting is the way in which the curve in the center of in the center bay, uh, in the bound version, the way this um, this uh, you know we create this kind of bubble, and uh, and that I think is not Monet-like. That part. Musical? Did he hear music? Did he like music? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, uh, yeah, he had, he had quite a few music, musical mm -hmm. friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So much, Idalan, and thank, thank you all for coming. And I'll say that you can see a lot of these letters between Barnes and Matisse. Um, that Yvonne was talking about just right outside in the, in the cases, mm -hmm. including the, the telegram that Matisse sends to Barnes when he has first realized, uh-oh, I think I made it. Can you imagine having to send that telegram? Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs>